again, welcome to our morning Bible study uh, for this particular day, October the 7th of uh, 2020. We are grateful and thankful to God just for the, the blessing that God has allowed us uh, to, to have another day and to experience life from the perspective of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you again for those of you that are calling in by way of conference call, those of you that are listening or looking uh, by way of uh, Facebook and YouTube. I want to certainly encourage us, uh, as you've done in the past, let's continue to re-engage uh, uh, in our study of the Word of God. We know it's part of the DNA of the Good Shepherd Church that we do meet on Wednesday mornings and then also on Wednesday evenings, and it's always with the intent uh, that we might study the Word of God together, have uh, communion with each other as it relates to community and the like, and so we are thankful again for that opportunity. We're going to go to God in prayer for, uh, for just a moment. Uh, we've got a lot of our members that are going through some issues, uh, some serious things of life. Um, Brother Clyde Berry is in hospice care. Um, uh, doctors have determined that's, that's all that they could do for him in terms of the cancer that he is experiencing. And there's nothing medically that could be done. But again, we do know God has the last word on all things. Uh, Sister Bessie Chandler is currently in hospice care. Her body is very, very feeble, very, very weak. So we ask you to continue prayer for her. Uh, we have found out that the uh, grandmother, Sister Melanie Jones, passed away. And so we want to be lifting Melanie and her family uh, in prayer. Uh, our own brother Larry Henry had a defibrillator actually having to be removed because that infection had uh, uh, been involved. Uh, but it's been removed. We had the surgery done. Got to wait two weeks. And then they're going to put the defibrillator in another place asking that you continue praying for him. Uh, our own Sister Denise Harris is going to be having surgery on October the 13th, so we want to lift her up in prayer. And also uh, her father-in-law, Charles Harris, um, we, we, you know, we call him that, uh, that tall angel uh, who is recovering from, uh, from hip surgery uh, that he just, uh, just had. And uh, he is home and recovering, and we're just going to just continue praying for him. And then, of course, we know we have all our other members that we continue praying for. And I pray that as you are receiving the uh, emailed program from Julia every week, that you do take time, at least one day a week, to pray for our sick and homebound members and also to intercede for our family members and friends. And so uh, we, uh, we know there's a lot for us to pray about today, much for us to pray about. So let's do that. We're going to pause and go to God in prayer, and then we'll begin our uh, study for today. Father, once again, we are so thankful to you for the blessing of life. Thank you, Lord, for your greatness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And we clearly know that every day of our lives, we see that that grace becomes more and more sufficient for us. It's all that we need. And so we are grateful and thankful for your amazing grace. We also thank you, Lord, for your mercy, knowing that in our own lives, that there are things that we have done that have been contrary to your word and your will, but you apply your mercy. We know again that in life that we have our hardships that we deal with, but God, we thank you for your mercy uh, that continues to follow us uh, all the days of our life, and we are grateful and very thankful to you. So this morning, as we do come, as we intercede on behalf of our brothers and our sisters, we are praying for Clyde Berry Sr., we are praying for Essie Chandler, who are dealing with the issues of hospice care. We pray for their families. I pray for Lucy, Lord, uh, her care for her husband. She loves him dearly. Pray for uh, Clyde Jr., his concern for his dad. I pray uh, for the grandchildren and their concern. I pray for his sisters and brothers, all of them who are concerned about him. I pray for our church family. Uh, you know our love for him and our concern for Brother Clyde Berry. So we ask again, Lord, you continue to meet the need of his life. Our own dear sister Chandler, who is the uh, second oldest member of our church, uh, 92 years old and, and counting. We, uh, we recognize that her body is getting feeble and uh, she can't do what she used to do. But, Lord, we know ultimately that sister Chandler is in your hands. And we ask you continue to have mercy. Please, sir, have mercy upon her. We pray for Melanie and for her family, Lord, and the death of her grandmother, Lord, that you would grant comfort to that family uh, as only you are able to do. Help them to know the tears are real, the tears are fine. 
uh, but they're not to cry as though they have no hope. Thank you that she was a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, so we know that they can be comforted uh, with your word. For Larry Henry, uh, who had this surgery for the removal of the defibrillator, we ask again that you continue to heal his body and allow him uh, to recover well these next two weeks so that his strength can be regained so that, Lord, he can uh, move toward uh, getting that defibrillator put again because it's part of his, his uh, life capacity. So we pray you continue to keep him. We do pray for Denise as she uh, faces surgery on next week, Lord, that you would allow it to be successful and, Lord, to allow her healing to be to go well, the recovery to go well. We pray for the doctors, the nurses, the medicine, the machines. God, we do pray again even before she goes in. We know you could fix what's wrong. And so we do know you have the power. So we entrust her uh, to you, commit her to you. And then for Brother Charles Harris, uh, the, uh, the tall angel that we uh, see him as a giant in our, si in our eyesight, we pray for the recovery of his hip surgery. Uh, the boldness that it took to do it after he's already had one and to do it again. God, I pray again for your strength in him. I do pray that same thing for Sister Harris as she comes alongside her husband in this uh, season of recovery, Lord, that all will go well, uh, ultimately for your glory and your honor, for his children that will come alongside, the grandchildren that will come alongside. I pray that you continue to bless them all uh, in the need they stand. Continually for Carol and Ben, Lord, uh, we just ask you to continue to meet the needs of Carolyn's life, Brother Dave Callahan, um, so many others of our church uh, membership, Sister Bertha Doucette still pending, uh, the issues that she has had to deal with. We just, again, ask you to continue to meet her need, Sister Pauly Dunham, Sister Almira Ellison. Uh, God, you got all power. You can do all things, and we know that whatever you do is always well done. For the oldest member of our church, Sister Philomena Thomas, uh, to the youngest member of our church. We thank you for each and every one of them. And we ask again your continued blessing uh, in all of their lives. And then most of all, Lord, help us to live blessed. Uh, the word reminds us that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So help us to live blessed, not defeated, not fearful, not worried, not anxious, but help us to know we are blessed in the person of Jesus Christ. So we thank you now for this time together in your word. Thank you for all that you have done. We do pray for Kelly LaFleur in Louisiana who is uh, uh, who needs to walk, Lord. I pray for strength in his body uh, as only you can give, as only you can bring him back uh, to where he needs to be. Uh, bless his mom, bless uh, Carol in her concern for him. We pray these blessings now in the name of your son who is Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Uh, many of you already have the, the handout. Uh, hopefully you uh, uh, have been availed with those. If you don't have it, uh, let us know and we'll make sure that we, uh, we can get them to you because remember everything that we're doing is based upon a recording that you can always go back to uh, to be able to uh, be a part of the, uh, the study that we do each and every Wednesday. And remember, I did say that right now, today, is uh, what we're going to do is going to be uh, all that we're going to do for is our study for today. And I pray that uh, you will watch the video this evening. If you haven't uh, done so, um, make sure that you do watch it. And try to do it on Wednesdays. That's the encouragement. And I'm going to encourage us to edify each other and remind others uh, to that very fact. I think I gave you a phone call this morning just encouraging us to do that. Um, uh, because I, uh, I, I've noticed that our numbers have kind of gone down, but I just, again, just as a way of reminder that we ought to be engaged in the Word of God. I certainly want to applaud and thank God for the teaching uh, gift that God has given in the person of uh, Reverend Sean Aguilar, who has been, uh, did, a, did a, a masterful teacher job uh, these last uh, four or five weeks, uh, and I am so grateful to him just to... Uh, uh, to see again the studies that he has done and, and communicating the word of God and uh, rightly dividing the, uh, the word of truth. So again, uh, Sean, if you happen to be listening or looking, uh, thank you so much again for your gift and uh, we appreciate the giftedness that God has given you uh, in the body of Christ. We're still dealing with the book of Daniel. Um, he, he did mass, mass wonderful in, in reminding us of what the book of Daniel is really about. 
uh, we see the sovereignty of God, uh, how God is totally in control of all things, how he, he makes happen what he wants to happen. <laughs> you know, everything that he created, uh, he's not surprised by anything. He created it, so he controls it. Uh, the other thing is that in the midst of his sovereignty, what we witness is in terms of Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel, we uh, witnessed uh, the faithfulness and how God sovereignly provides for his people who remain faithful to him um, and how he shows that control. And so uh, even though they had to deal with the issue of uh, the fiery furnace, Daniel had to deal with the issue of not compromising uh, his, uh, his belief and his ethics. Um, God provided for them. And we read that in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Uh, and then, of course, when we got to chapter 4, you know, help us to see that uh, God sovereignly rules not only in the lives of believers, but he also sovereignly rules in the lives of unbelievers. This world belongs to God. He's in control of this. He got this thing, you know. And what we've got to do is learn what to do, uh, to put our trust, our confidence, our faith, uh, our belief, the fact that we rely totally on him for every single solitary thing at every point of our lives. And so when we, what we're looking at now is that Daniel, has been allowed. We go back as far as Daniel is concerned from biblical history, you go back as far as what would be what we would use that number 605 BC, 605 years before Christ came. Uh, the Bible talks about the fact, or the scripture teaches us, and even extra biblical uh, historical facts that you would look at for as Babylon is concerned, that they overtook Israel uh, in 605 BC. And at that point, uh, a lot of the Young people, people of, of nobility and the like, were actually exported or exiled into Babylon. Uh, Pastor Aguilar mentioned that to us in terms of uh, how they had to travel just to get to Babylon uh, because now the prediction that God had given to uh, Jeremiah that they would be in, in exile for 70 years had, had is now, was now coming into fruition starting in 605. They go to the exile as far as Babylon, and now during that time, that's when Daniel, as a young man, if you will, uh, 605 B.C., is um, in Babylon, and God, you know, God elevates him because he's, in, what, he's sovereignly in control, and Daniel was what? He was faithful to God uh, in every circumstance, so God blessed him. And, of course, when we read chapter 4, we look at chapter 4 on last week, uh, based upon Reverend, what Reverend Eggelard shared with us, one of the main things to keep in mind is would, would be the last two verses of chapter 4. And I want to just revisit that for just a moment. It says, at the same time, my reason returned to me. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. He says, for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my nobles resorted to me, and I was restored to my kingdom, and the excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, and notice what he says, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. So when we read chapter 4, or looking at the end of chapter 4, look at the events of chapter 4, you want to make sure you mentally carry over what you read in chapter 4, or what we learn from chapter 4 in terms of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's pride, and then ultimately God putting him down, God abasing him. He exalts himself, but God abases him. Why? Because he is sovereignly in control. Uh, and so now, uh, it's important to carry over chapter 4 over to chapter 5 because you want to have that context of the pride that he once experienced. But we know that at the end of, li or at the end of those seven years of his, uh, of his uh, having to you know, move about like an animal and all of that sort of thing, uh, ultimately, he, he dropped that pride. His, his pride changed. And he recognized it was not that he was the king, he recognized that God was the king, and that's important. Matter of fact, uh, going to the handout, when you look at it, the, uh, the first thing that we're looking at, it says, The Most High God set Belshazzar, uh, his name means Bel, protect the king, as king after Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the word means Nebo, defend the boundary, had died. What did he do? He praised, he extolled, and he honored God as the king of heaven. Go back to chapter 4 for just right quick, just right quick. Notice in, in verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height 
I'm sorry, verse 1 of Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 4. I'm looking at chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the peoples and nations that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Uh, I thought it good to declare to you the signs and wonders that, watch this, the most high God has worked for me. How great are his signs and, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. That's, that's amazing. And listen, uh, it's important for us to keep that in mind that even though we're in the government that we are, we're in the times that we are, this still applies to God today. He is still sovereignly ruling everything and he he still does his signs. He still does his mighty wonders. His kingdom is still an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. He talks about that same thing in chapter, in, in chapter 4, verse 17. This is decision. This is uh, 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 Daniel speaking to him. It's by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know, that the living may know. I'm talking about even right now that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and watch this, gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. God will put people in positions that you never ever imagined would be in that position. Why? Because he sovereignly rules. He created all of those persons. And the Bible clearly teaches us in Romans 13, all government is ordained by God. So as it relates to the issue of government, he places up, who he, so, his, so we're looking at that handout, it says he gives it to the lowest of men. It can be low from the standpoint of just that character, or it could be low in terms of how people may view that individual. You think about Daniel in um, 1 Samuel 16, Samuel wasn't even looking for Daniel because, you know, Jesse said at the end of the day, hey man, I got one more, but he a shepherd. You know, he a stinky little boy. You know, he deal with them sheep. Samuel said, hey, bring him. He's got to be the one. And ultimately, he was anointed as the king of Israel, uh, the greatest king that Israel ever had. Uh, he says the same thing in chapter 4, verse 26. Again, that's still in the book of Daniel. And as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom, Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Your kingdom come, Father. Your will be done. Let's not get it twisted, folks. But let's not get it twisted. We're not running anything. <laughs> We're not running. We're not running anything. God is ruling. God is ruling. Now, what God wants, uh, he says, you know, we pray that. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants us to participate in that. But ultimately, let's understand, God is actually running this. He has his way. So uh, look at verse 26. And again, if you're filling out that blank that's right there, to know he rules. Just put those, those, uh, those four words, to know he rules. In verse 32, he says he gives, he gives as he chooses. I love that. I love that at the, end, at the end of the verse, it says, then they shall drive you from men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it. He gives it to whomever he chooses. What is he showing? The kingdom of heaven belongs to him. The kingdoms on earth belong to him. And he gives it and he takes it away from whomever he chooses. Uh, 34, if you fill it in the blank right there, uh, chapter 4, verse 34, lives forever. He lives forever. Nobody can make that claim. <laughs> Nobody can make that claim. Because notice he says in verse 34 of chapter 4, and at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him, watch this, who lives, what, forever. No human being can make that claim. You know, we think about the 200, 244 years of existence of the, uh, the United States of America. We are now on President 45. Come on. And all of those presidents, most of them uh, that, 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 that served prior to, they're all dead. But there's one who still rules and reigns, and he what? He lives forever. So you're filling in that blank. That's the two words, lives forever. And then chapter 4, verse 35, just kind of closing that out. He says, uh, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does, meaning God, according to his will in the army of heaven, and watch this, and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, 
What have you done? Nobody. <laughs> Think about that. God is so sovereign that nobody can question what he does. That is just absolutely awesome. Now, the, the great thing about us, what we do, we got to learn to appreciate that. Most of us, most of us struggle with having anybody not having an answer to us. Uh, and listen, there is one who does not have to answer to anybody, and he is God. And so he is sovereignly in control. So now number two on the, uh, on the handout. And I want you to bring forth chapter four as you look at chapter five. The Most High God's lessons of the past were disregarded and rejected by the following generations. Remember in, in, in verse 3, we talked about the fact that it, at the end of the day, what God was saying, he wanted it to be understood. In verse 3 of chapter 4, it says his dominion is from generation to generation. Now watch this. Here is what we do now. We have a transition that's taken place. Nebuchadnezzar has died. Um, Belshazzar is now the king. Uh, history would show, extra bi biblical history would show that, that Belshazzar was really not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He was probably more the grandson. Uh, his father's name was Nebun Nebun Nebuchadnezzar. And um, uh, when you read history, that was a period of time where Nebuchadnezzar, again, who, who succeeded his father, Nebuchadnezzar, um, actually was gone away from the, the from Babylon and empire as he's trying to, if you would, conquer the world. Uh, he's gone for about 10 years. Uh, and that's what their history, Babylonian history would show. During that 10 year period, the, uh, the reign of uh, the, the kingdom for, as far as the Babylon was concerned in that particular area was his son who was considered, if you would, a co-regent uh, although he was a prince, God, he had he had now become the leader, especially of of Babylon proper. Let me just say it that way. He was the leader of Babylon proper. Uh, his father again, Nebuchadnezzar, and he is again Belshazzar. He is probably more than likely the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and now he's ruling. So notice the transition. It goes from Nebuchadnezzar in verse thirty-seven of chapter four. Then it says Belshazzar, the king was made. He made great feasts. Uh, for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of a thousand. So what we have is that um, uh, chapter chapter 5, look at verse 1, Belshazzar orchestrated a huge feast. And he's just given a story. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to the king. I mean, I'm, just, I'm sorry. He gave the command to bring the gold, the silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar. That word father, that, uh, again, it would appear to us that he would say, uh, but that word father could, be, could also be ancestor. Uh, it's a terminology that we often use sometimes in our, in our Christian circles, uh, in the clergy circles. Um, the, we will refer to a son in the ministry, or we'll say, my father in the ministry. Although it's not a biological connection, it's just a term of, again, of respect. So even though Nebuchadnezzar was the grandfather of Belshazzar, he still, the, the scriptures refer to him as the father, meaning as an ancestor. It means as one who... Uh, 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 is responsible in very real sense for his, his being here, but it was not his biological dad in actuality. So uh, he had taken, the, the, his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, and watch this, this, this is what, 605 B.C. I want you to just write that number down somewhere if you can, 605 B.C. Just write that somewhere uh, in your on your on your sheet somewhere and if, maybe even in your Bible just as an indication of the kind of time span that we're talking about when we get to chapter five. All right. So um, uh, and the king and his lord and his wives and his concubine might drink from them. Boy, I tell you, they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubine drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone. I'm telling you, Belshazzar had, I mean, this dude was throwing a serious party. I'm talking about is way beyond Prince's 1999. I'm talking, I'm talking a show enough, throw down, we gonna get towed up from the low up, drunk as we can, party. Again, notice again, notice the language. He, they already, they already, he th he, they already drinking wine, 
And then he had the wild idea. Say, hey, you know, my 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 grandfather got all yeah 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 yeah. No, my grandfather got all of them. Say, hey, y'all go over there and get that them vessels from my grand my granddaddy brought over here. Bring them vessels over here, and we gonna drink from that. The problem was, remember, those vessels had been a, been been designed as holy to God, right? So now, Belshazzar throws this great feast. We look at it in, in verse 1 and verse 2. There's a lot of strong drinking, if you fill it in the blank, a lot of strong drinking um, in, in chapter, in verse 3. That was the desecration of the sacred. Those vessels, those cups, all of those things that were part of the temple, those were considered sacred as far as the Jews were concerned, as far as Israel was concerned, as far as the, the Hebrews were concerned. But it was also an indication, if you would, of just how rebellious that Israel had become, where Nebuchadnezzar, God had given Nebuchadnezzar the power to overtake them in such a manner that he could take things out of the holy temple of God, the holy temple of God, and now they're being used for unholy purposes. They're being used just to do whatever you want to do with them. And, of course, we look at verse 4. There was also what the worship of idols. Again, if you're filling in the blanks. Drinking, sacred, and idols. They were worshiping idols. And, of course, think about this. The Bible clearly talks about it in Ephesians um, chapter 5. It said, don't, worry, don't be drunk with wine which is dissipation, which is wasteful. So, so now that they are in the state where they are, that they are drunk, they are, you know, they are, they are celebrating, they dancing, they, I mean, they just having a great time. I mean, and I'm telling you, they're getting toe down, messed up, if you will. But what happens now? Rather than worshiping God, look at verse 5. They drank wine and praised the gods of the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron, wood, and stone. They began to worship the creation rather than what? The creator. And of course, they didn't have the law that, that Israel had. But at the end of the day, they, they, you know, God has already demonstrated in Nebuchadnezzar what he's able to do. So now you've got a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar who's doing something totally different. So watch this. Let's keep going. Uh, number three, the debauchery was demonstrated, was disturbed, I'm sorry, was disturbed by a supernatural occurrence that shook Belshazzar to his core. Let's look at, let's look at what happened in chapter five, verse five. It says, and at the same hour, the king, the fingers, the fingers, I want y'all to think about that, the fingers of a man's hand. Somebody's supposed to get excited right now. You're supposed to get excited. You know you ain't never seen that. The, the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall on the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote Verse 6 says, the king's countenance was changed. I know it was. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Uh, verse 7 says, and the king cried out aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, the the king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold on his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. Oh, now remember, they having this 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 drunken, towed down drunk party. They are partying hardy, right? And while the party is going on, they bring it in these vessels for them <laughs> to drink from. While the party is going on, now watch this. Remember, they drunk. They drunk. They drunk. And, you know, they starting to see things in their mind. They see things that, 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 that just can't be real. But what happens now is say that they see the fingers of a man's hand. The fingers of a man's hand. It didn't say the hand. It said, <laughs> it said the fingers of a man's hand are now writing on the wall. So they go from this, this state of euphoria and debauchery and drunkenness to just utter fear and horror. And they are 
frightened by what they're seeing. Why? Because God is supernaturally intervened in this situation. Because remember we said, whatever he creates, he controls. I don't know about you all, but I love humor. The humor of the Bible just amazes me. The stuff that goes on to me that, that's humorous, I, that just amazes me. I know sometimes we look at the Bible and we, can't, we say, I don't, I don't see where nothing funny is there. This is funny. These people are having a great time, and while they're drunk, God now shows up and he intervenes in that situation. We're going to see how we know it's God that does it. But notice what happens. The fingers of a man hand appeared and wrote a strange message. It was a strange message. The king was horrified and afraid physically and mentally. And then he requested an immediate answer to no avail. Somebody need to tell me what's that writing. Okay, so what do they do? They call all of they, you know, their astrologers and the Chaldeans and, you know, the folk that do the, you know, the Ouija board and the voodoo and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. They are supposed to now give them the answer to what was written by the fingers of a man's hand that's writing on the wall appearing to folk who are just towed up from the flow up drunk, right? We'll go to number four on your handout. The present administration sought the answer from the prophet of the past who had the spirit of the holy God. Now watch this. Here it is. We go from Nebuchadnezzar's administration and now it's Belshazzar, right? And, and just like there was chaos in Nebuchadnezzar's administration, we're now seeing chaos in Belshazzar's uh, uh, administration or even Nebuchadnezzar's administration because here it is. The king is actually not there. It's his co-regent or his son, the prince, who's actually ruling at that time. So that's chaos, if you would, in the government. There's chaos all over the place. People are looking at this and, man, this, this stuff is crazy what's going on. I mean, and the, 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 the issue is because Nebuchadnezzar had been gone, you know, economically, they weren't doing as well. I mean, that was just a lot of crazy things that were going on. Look at this dude. He's putting a party together for a thousand folk, a thousand people. So it means that they loose. They doing all loosey-goosey. They do whatever it is they want to do. But here it is that, that in the midst of all of that chaos, there's some steadiness. Look at, chat, look at verse 10. The queen, because of the words of the kings uh, and her lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your continents change. In other words, she said, don't be anxious and don't be worried. He says, there is a man in your kingdom. I love that language. In whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, meaning in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, your grandfather, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And, the, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Notice how this lady, this is a, again, remember, she is, she is a queen of a, of, a, of, a, of a pagan nation. She's married to a pagan man. This man doesn't believe in God. But here it is, she's being reminded there is this cat, this man, who lives in the kingdom by the name of Daniel, with all of the chaos that's going on, the one thing we know we can rely on was the man of God. We could rely on this brother named Daniel. We could rely on prophet Daniel. We could rely on Reverend Daniel. We could rely, <laughs> we could rely on him. Why? Because he's steady in the midst of the chaos. Watch this. He was steady in the midst of the chaos under Nebuchadnezzar. He was, he's steady in the, in the chaos in the midst of with Belshazzar that in the midst, even if the administration is changing, because of his devotion to God, Daniel is steady. Yeah. <laughs> because he's faithful to God. It really doesn't matter to him who is running. He doesn't matter if it's Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't matter if it's Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't matter if it's Belshazzar. What he understands is that the king of kings and the lord of lords is the one who's really running his stuff. So 
he remains steady. He doesn't allow anything to distract him. And watch this, and other people know it. I would like to ask this question. Do other people know that you are a Christian in the midst of the government that we got right now? It, do, do other people know that you are a Christian in the midst of the chaos and everything that's going on in our culture, in our government, in our society right now with a pandemic, with economic downturns, with all of the things that are going on? Are you recognized in your neighborhood, on your job, um, uh, in, amongst your family? Are you recognized as the, the steady one? Can people go to you to say, hey, well, now what you think about all of this? You know, I heard what they said, and I heard what they said, and I heard what they doing, and I see what's going on there. Are you the one in your family that are focused saying, hey, that's the go-to person. Let me, let me see what sister so-and-so says about this. Let me see what mama say about this. Let me see what daddy say about this. Let me see what cuz say about this. Let me see what my uncle thinks about this. Let me see what my aunt thinks. Let me see what my grandmother, how she's looking at this. Are you the steady one? In your family, in the midst of all the chaos, Danny was steady, man. He was steady. A lot of crazy stuff that's going on. New administration coming on after Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, now Belshazzar, who's not taking care of business. But Daniel is steady in the midst of it all. So what we're looking at, Daniel was identified, I'm back at the handout, as God's representative who had a prominent role in the previous pagan rulership. When you look at verse 13 through 16, Daniel was called before the king and promised what? Rewards, if you fill it in the blanks there. He was promised rewards for his interpretive skills. Look at verse 17. Daniel rejected the gifts, but willfully gave the king the interpretation. Look at verse 17. We're going to read that. And Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another, yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now remember, this is the same dude when he was a youngster. He didn't compromise when the king, when you remember when they, when they said, hey, we're going to give you the king's food to eat, we're going to give you the king's wine to drink. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. I'll tell you what, well, here's what you do. You give us the vegetables. You remember that. Early on, Danny chapter 1. He did not compromise in, 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 in terms of taking what the government wanted to offer him or what others wanted to offer him. He recognized what I'm going to do, I'm going to just stay focused on what God wants. That's what I'm going to do. And so even in this, he's offering him a reward. He said, no, nah, I don't want it. But I tell you what, I will tell you the interpretation of the handwriting on the wall. <coughs> Uh, in, verse, in, in verse 18 through 20, Daniel recalled how God Most High gave Nebuchadnezzar his place, position, and power. I'm sorry. His place, position, power, and prominence that led to, watch this, enormous pride. It led to enormous pride. Now watch this. Here's, here's what's happening when you look at... Uh, uh, verse uh, 19 and verse uh, 20. I'm going to just go to verse 20 now. Watch this. But when his heart was lifted up, meaning God had given him a wonderful kingdom, God had given him majesty, God had given him promise man, prominence, man. He was probably the most popular person in the world. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, verse 20, in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Ooh -wee. Ooh -wee. He, his pride, his pride. I mean, you know, he remember he had that dream. Daniel gave the interpretation of that dream. And this guy bought into that dream. He bought into that dream. So what does he do? He has this statue erected, and now he's bragging about all that he is. And, and the words say that, wow, one day when he's looking at, oh, look at how great a kingdom I have. Look at what I have done. Look at what I have accomplished. There has never been any king in the world like me. Look at me. Look at what I am able to do. The Bible says that while those words were yet in his mouth, the ancients came. They came. <laughs> and, and from that point on, the man lived like an animal for seven years, folk, because of pride. The Bible clearly says that pride comes what, before the fall. Be careful. Be careful. Romans chapter 15, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, he says, I said to Paul, says, I say to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think soberly as God has given to each one of us as far as believers a measure of the faith. Be careful about pride. Be careful about thinking you the only one got it going on. Think, be careful about thinking, you know, ain't no family like my family, and my family is better than every other family. Uh, be, be careful about your own personal pride that you, you know, kind of feel like the sun rises and set on you, and there ain't nobody, ain't nobody like you. You know, ain't nobody going to mess with me. And God says be very, very careful because even as believers, if we're not careful, uh, we can get caught up in pride. You know, people can tell us how good we are, and we start believing that. You know what, one of the things that I learned, I, I've learned all day long. It doesn't matter what people say about me. What I recognize, I know me, and you don't know me like I know me. So even though you think I'm all of that plus a bag of potato chips, I recognize that there are some insufficiencies in me. I recognize that there's a, still a struggle that goes on in me personally. Amen? So just keep that in mind going forward. So, again, you're looking at the handout. If you're filling in those blanks there in verse uh, 5, 13 through 16, the blank there is the rewards. rewards. Uh, in verse uh, 18 through 20, the blank there is the word enormous, E-N-O-R-M-O-U-S. He had enormous pride, E-N-O-R-M-O-U-S, enormous pride. I mean, I'm just saying this way. He had the big head. Let's put it that way. And so now what happens? Look at verse 21. The pride resulted in being demoted to live as an animal until he knew the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men. Verse 21 says, and then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him like grass, grass like an oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew, he knew. He came to be the awareness that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints it, folks, let's not forget that, and appoints it to whomever he chooses. He points it to whomever he chooses. Now, now listen, I know we, we're getting ready now, and I hear all of the talk. Um, um, uh, we're going to say, what, six days from today, we can go vote. Well, some of you are already doing that. If you're doing it by way of uh, uh, a mail-in ballot, some of you probably have already done it. Uh, but I want, I want us to keep in mind, keep in mind that as we're doing the voting, we got to keep in mind that God is still in control of this thing. Please keep that in mind. Uh, now watch this. And, and you ask, you say, okay, well, you know, I'm talking about voting and stuff. I mean, well, how does God control voting? You know, when you read, when you read in the Bible at different times, uh, the Bible talk about they, uh, they cast lots. You know, you, you talk about they cast lots. And notice, almost every time you read that they cast lots in the Bible, the lot always fell the way God wanted it to fall. <laughs> so, so what that says to us, that even though we, watch this, ought to exercise the human right to vote, remember, our human right does not override the sovereign will of God. You got to keep that in mind. You got to, we got to trust God with that. We got to rely upon God for that. And it's encouraging. I'm saying it. You ought to vote. Why? Because it's a way of, of honoring all men. Listen, here's the truth. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. For those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, the Bible actually says this. We're citizens of heaven, right? And watch this. If we never went to vote, if we never ever went to vote, but we kept relying on the Lord, that's really where we're supposed to be, right? But remember, we're under government. We've been given a human right to vote. People have died, we say that, for that opportunity for to exercise the vote. But never ever think my human desire or my human works will, will in some way uh, be more important or override the sovereign will of God. Why is that important? Remember, this democracy that we live in has existed, listen to the folk, for only 244 years. But the sovereign God that we serve has always existed. He has existed ever since he said, let that be. Matter of fact, he was existing even before he said, let that be. Because he is an eternal God. He has no beginning. He has no ending. So what we've got to do, we've got to put on the mind of God. We've got to be thinking, okay, we recognize. I know I'm going to vote, but at the end of the day, Lord, I recognize whoever you put in, that's who you want in. But in the midst of it all, even if you put somebody in that may not care nothing about me, 
it doesn't stop you, God, from taking care of me. It doesn't stop you from supplying my needs as you promised that you would. So just keep that in mind going forward. Absolutely. Starting next, next Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock. That's my plan that I get through with my prayer with my Levite brothers at 6.30 in the morning. I'm going to be dressed and ready to go to the polls. I want to be one of the first ones, first hour that they can go early voting. I'm going to cast my vote. But when I cast that vote, I'm keeping in mind that there is a God who is taking care of me, not a Democratic Party, not a Republican Party, not a Libertarian Party. It's God who takes care of us. So now, last part he says in, in, in chapter 5, verse 22, uh, he says, Daniel reminded and reprimanded Belshazzar that writing was for the pride, that that the, the writing was for the pride he refused to repent from. God's holiness was desecrated, God's creation was worshipped, and God was not glorified. Look at, uh, look at verse 23. It says, and you have lifted you, meaning Belshazzar now. This is, this is, this is, this is Daniel talking to Belshazzar. You have lifted up your, your, yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Ooh, that's a bad thing to do, y'all. You have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the God of silver and gold and bronze and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath, oh, oh, the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. The fingers of the hands were sent from him, and his writing was written. Oh, he reminded him in verse 22, but you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. Belshazzar was aware of what God had done with Nebuchadnezzar. He was aware that his grandfather had gone through that experience. He was aware that his grandfather had praised and extolled and honored God. But when he gets in the position that he was in, he forgot all of that. Listen, folk, I'm going to tell you this. No matter how high you get in life, no matter what you achieve in life, Please don't ever forget it's the Lord that got you to where you are. Don't ever, ever, ever forget that. Don't ever think, man, I'm doing this. Hey, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm doing my own thing. I'm, I'm, I'm achieving my own. I'm making my own success. I'm making my own way. Don't you ever forget, especially when you come from a family that reminds you that the Lord brought you. The Lord is the one that made a way. The Lord is the one that got you to where you are when you are on your own. Don't you forget that it was the Lord that got you to where you are. Oh, you did. And listen, I know sometimes I hear some folks say, oh, man, that's old fogey. That's old timey. But I'm telling you, I thank God I got that old time religion. I'd be telling you, forgive me that old time religion. It was good for my mama. It was good for my daddy. And we say it like this. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for Paul and Silas. And tell you what, I'm telling you, it's good enough for me. So don't ever forget, no matter how high you get in life, no matter what status you may achieve in life, don't forget what you were told in your past that it's the Lord that has brought you to where you are. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, folks. When I, look at, when I look at our elders, when I consider, you know, when we, think we, we, we look at our ancestors, many of them, again, were not, that, not, not rich people. Many of them were. In our context, I'm talking about, you know, for us, what I know, my dad said he went to the ninth grade. My mom did the third grade. I mean, they weren't no highly educated people. But, boy, they knew how to run a budget. They knew how to run a house. They knew how to take care of a family. Uh, you know, they knew how to make the purchases that they needed. They, man, they did some remarkable things, not having, quote, unquote, a whole lot of education. So now for me to, you know, who, 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 who got a couple of degrees to start thinking now, that what my mom and daddy did was nothing. No, when my mom and daddy taught me that it was the Lord that brought them to where they are today, I'm telling you, don't ever get too high. Belshazzar forgot. He rejected what God had done in the life of his grandfather, and, and 
he was smelling himself in some terrible way now. So what happens? And we close it. Number five. The most high God's message was interpreted by Daniel. He was promoted by, he was, I'm sorry. The most high God's message was interpreted by Daniel. He was promoted. But Belshazzar died that same night being replaced by the new administration of Darius the Mede, or Darius the Mede. Let me fill in those, uh, those blanks there. Chapter 5, 25 through 31. Many, God gave the term limitation. <laughs> I love that. God gives the term limitation. God is the one who determines how long somebody going to do what they do. The word tekel, he says, you have missed God's standard. You miss God's standards. And then the word perez, God has raised another to replace you. That's, that's, that's really what he's showing. So let's look at that verse 24, verse on that verse 25, just for our edification. This is the inscription that was written. Many, many, or really it's just actually one time. Many, I'm going to just do what the scripture said. Many, many, tekel you farsen. Many, many, tekel you farsen. Again, this is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede, or Darius the Mede, Received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. <laughs> Listen, God is the one who transitions all human administration. That's the subject we've been dealing with. So, so when God gets ready, it doesn't matter who the person is, doesn't matter how long they've served, doesn't matter what they've done. When God makes the term determination that they are done, they are done. That's it. And there's no human being that can change what God does. Why? Because he's not only the king of heaven, but he's also the king of the inhabitants of the earth. So God makes it again. Daniel gives this prophecy. He lays it out. He says, hey, man, your, your time is done. That's basically what he's saying. Um, your, uh, God has numbered your kingdom. It's finished. The, watch this. Your kingdom is finished. Watch this. Not, that's, that's important. It wasn't just your time is finished, your kingdom is finished. Because literally God now is transitioning from the, the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, now going to D D Darius, the rule of the Medes and the Persians. Now watch this. Let me show you this, and then we're going to be done. Remember, we introduced to Daniel, uh, uh, and, and, and his deportation was in 605 B.C. He's under the administration of Nebuchadnezzar, He's under the administration of Nebuchadnezzar. He's under the administration of Belshazzar. All right? Now, uh, uh, extra biblical history could show, when you read the records of the Babylonians, it could show that they were overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, or the records of the Medes and the Persians would show that they overtook the Babylonians in 539 B.C. Now, look at how long Daniel had been serving. Look at how long Daniel had been faithful to God. <laughs> Look at how long Daniel had been steady. 605 B.C. as a, as a young man, it's now 539 B.C. Again, if, I, if I'm doing my math right, that's 66 years. That is 66 years. He has been faithfully serving God for 66 years at this point, at this point. But watch this. All these administrations had changed, but he remained faithful to God. And so I'm saying to, you, to us, no matter how many different administrations we may face in life, our goal is to be faithful to God. Doesn't matter how many presidents come, how many presidents go that we can be under. Doesn't matter how many parties come, how many parties go. All of that can be true for us. But at the end of the day, what God is saying to us is that he is the one who transitions all human administrations. He even does it in our own lives. You know, when I, when I consider and I, and, I, and, I, and I praise God and I humbly praise God, uh, for the fact that, in, that, that <coughs> this coming uh, uh, December, it's going to be 30 years that I'm serving as the pastor of Good Shepherd Church. 
But it's clear to me, it's clear to me that when God started this work through uh, Pastor uh, Milton Johnson in 1959, when he started this work, he had already determined that that was going to be a time of ministration for Johnson. Uh, 1973, up until 1990, August 22nd of 1990, he had determined that that was going to be administration of Anazine Wilson. It's clear to me that I'm not going to always be here. I mean, because God is the one who determines when we serve, how long we're going to serve, what we do. Why? Because he is sovereignly in control of every single detail of our lives. So, Father, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, let's keep that in mind going forward. Let's keep that in mind going forward. I definitely want to encourage us, please go and vote uh, on next week. But as you are making your decisions, as you get your sample ballot, and as you start checking off <coughs> who you want to vote for, you keep in mind that when the results come out on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday or whenever they finish, whenever they finish, at the end of the day, our vote does not in any way supersede the sovereignty of God. Let's keep that in mind. And if we can operate from that point, then we know that our lives, in a very real sense, are glorifying God. Why? Because our Father is totally in control of all things. Father, how we love you, how we thank you again for reminding us through your word that this world is yours. You do what you will. You put people in place. You put them down when you choose to. You elevate. You abase. Because this world ultimately is yours. Help us to always trust you, rely upon you, depend on you, and to know that whatever you do is the always the best thing for us because you reminded us in Romans 8, 28, you cause all things to work together for our good, for those of us who love you, and for those of us who are called according to your purposes. Sometimes what you do don't feel good. Sometimes it is painful. Sometimes it does cause us to want to become anxious and worried and, and, and just kind of lose grips with the reality. But for us, God, we're convinced that in the end, you will always cause it to work out the way you ultimately have it to work out. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, I said it again in the telephone message, and I'm going to say it one more time while all of you are looking at me, can see me. I love you all. And uh, here's what I would ask. If you are interested in saying returning to the building, I just want you to give Julia a call. You can, matter of fact, you can call her right now. She'll be waiting to hear from your call. So if you would do that for us, I just want some names. It's kind of a database to see if those of you may be interested and see what we can do going forward, hopefully, to sort of open things up just a little bit more. Until then, until then God bless you, and may the Lord keep each and every one of us is my prayer. I love you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>